Hi, I'm James Hamilton from Stumping Up's Woodworking Journal, and this is the third of our five-part tutorial on table saw safety, how to make effective rip cuts, how to make effective cross cuts, how to make effective miters and bevels, and how to get the best cuts in plywood and sheet goods. If you're a veteran table saw user, you'll find some useful tips and maybe identify some areas where you can sort of tune up your skills. And if you're a new woodworker, these videos will give you a big head start and help you keep your fingers where they belong. As each of these five videos are released, I'll add links in the notes below. Just click on show more if you're on YouTube. We've already posted one on safety and one on rip cuts, but today we're going to focus on cross cuts. Cuts made across the grain. We'll start with the fundamentals, we'll throw in some tips and troubleshoot the problems you may encounter. Some folks are a pleasure to work with, like Ken Rizzo over at woodturnerswonders.com. That's where I get my turning stuff, like sanding supplies and CBN wheels for my grinder. Seriously, if you haven't seen what CBN wheels can do for you, you are missing out. I'll put a link below this video. Use it and tell Ken I sent you. First, let's talk about your blade. In the old timey days, you would use one type of blade for rip cuts and another for cross cuts. That was fine with hand saws, but nobody wants to switch their table saw blades back and forth. So they came out with general purpose and combination blades that would do both jobs reasonably well. In the case of a combination blade, 40 of the 50 teeth are pointed like little knives to sever wood fibers during cross cuts. The other 10 are flat across the top like chisels, which are better for rip cuts. So it's an all in one solution. 90% of your table saw cuts, whether they're with the grain or across the grain, can be made with a 40 tooth general purpose or 50 tooth combination blade. I say 90% because there are times when this blade won't do the job. You see, with any saw blade, you have to find a balance between the quality of the cut and the efficiency of the cut. To cut efficiently, a blade has to clear the dust from the kerf quickly. Otherwise, the blade will become overwhelmed, it'll heat up and vibrate, and leave scorch and blade marks behind. The dust is cleared by the gullets between the teeth. The fewer the teeth on the blade, the wider the gullets and the faster it will clear dust. But especially when you're cutting across the grain, the fewer teeth you have, the more chipping and splintering and tear out you're going to get. You have to find a balance. Do you add teeth and make the gullet smaller to avoid tear out? Or do you subtract teeth and make the gullets larger for faster, cooler performance? Saw blade manufacturers know that most table saw cuts are rips with the grain where tear out isn't an issue. So when they make combination blades, they lean towards efficiency, fewer teeth. But those 40 or 50 teeth can still cause a lot of tear out when you cut across the grain. Not enough that it will matter when you're cutting your project parts to rough dimensions, but when you're making finished cuts where tear out will be visible in the assembled project, you'll want a blade with more teeth, like an 80 tooth blade that's made specifically for nice cross cuts. A while back we made a more comprehensive tutorial about saw blades and different teeth configurations. I'll link to that below this video too. For now, I wanted to make sure you understood that a general purpose or combination blade is great for everyday rips and cross cuts, but as you'll learn as we progress through this video and the next ones, it shouldn't be your only cross cut blade in your shop. Choosing the right blade isn't the only thing you should consider before you make a cross cut on the table saw. You also have to think about how you're going to guide your workpiece through the cut. With a rip cut, you can use your table saw's fence, but not with a cross cut, because cross cuts are usually made to shorten long, narrow boards. You can't put the narrow end of a board against your fence, because you wouldn't be able to keep it from twisting in the middle of a cut. That's how people get seriously hurt. As a general rule, if the edge against the fence is shorter than the distance between the fence and the blade, you need a sled or a miter fence to support the workpiece. Table saw slats are fantastic because they lift your workpiece up off the top of the saw, which eliminates drag that may cause it to shift during the cut. And in some cases, you can even clamp your workpieces to the sled, which further prevents unwanted movement and is especially handy for small parts that would otherwise require your fingers to be close to the blade. The downside of a table saw sled is they're bulky and heavy. If you only have one or two cuts to make, you're unlikely to get out a big sled. That's why some people prefer miter gauges. These are light and easy to grab for a quick cut. But the biggest way you can improve your miter gauge is to add an auxiliary fence with some adhesive backed sandpaper. I'll put a link to the sandpaper I use in the notes below this video. 
This serves multiple purposes. First, the sandpaper will keep your workpiece from deflecting away from the blade as you cut it, a common cause of miscuts. By extending the fence past the blade, it will clear the offcuts at the end of the cut. The curve from the fence gives you a precise location to line up your cut, and it will protect the backside of the workpiece from tear out. We'll talk more about these things as we progress. So I've got my blade installed. I have my miter gauge with an auxiliary fence, and I have my safety glasses and hearing protection ready to go. My blade guard is removed only so you can see what I'm doing. Otherwise, it would be in place as well. As I proceed, it's important to let the blade do the work. If you force the wood into the blade faster than it wants to cut, you'll get a bunch of splinters and tear out. But if you hang back and cut too slowly, the teeth will build up heat from being in the curve longer than necessary and you'll leave scorch marks. You'll get a feel over time so you'll know if you're cutting too fast or too slow for the blade. As I get to the end of the cut, I want to push the workpiece past the blade and let my auxiliary fence clear the offcut. This is really useful because if I make a lot of offcuts and those little ends pile up next to the blade, the vibrations of the saw can cause them to work their way back and one can catch on a tooth and fly back at me. Clearing them with an auxiliary fence also makes it less likely that I'll try to flick one away with my hand while the blade's on, a dumb mistake that a surprising number of folks make. The biggest thing you have to watch out for when making a crosscut with a table saw is tear out, which occurs where the teeth exits the cut on the bottom and back edge of the workpiece. This is the biggest cause of poor crosscuts, and learning how to avoid it will make your projects look a lot better. So here are five solutions. The quality of your blade can make a big difference. Remember, the more teeth on the blade, the less likely it is to leave tear out. While I use a good combination blade for most cuts, I switch to an 80 tooth ATB blade for delicate finishing cuts that must be absolutely crisp and free from tear out. Your equipment's also a factor. If there's a gap in the throat insert next to your blade, there will be nothing to support the fibers on the bottom of the cut. Closing up that gap by making what's called a zero clearance insert will make a big difference. The same can be said about supporting the fibers on the back side of the workpiece where the blade exits the cut. A clean kerf through an auxiliary fence will support those fibers as well. If you don't have time to make an auxiliary fence or a zero clearance insert, you can try strengthening the fibers by putting a piece of blue tape on the bottom and back edge of the workpiece, then cutting through that. The tape will strengthen the bond between all the individual fibers so they can resist splintering together. Finally, you could just be proactive. Use a knife to score along your cut line, severing the outer fibers before you make a cut so they can't bend and fray. It's common for a woodworker to cross cut several parts to the same length, and while you can measure, mark, and cut each one individually, it's faster and more accurate to use a stop block, and there are a couple of ways to do it. The first way is the most common. You line up your first cut, then clamp a scrap against the end of the workpiece. Of course, you're limited by the length of your miter gauge fence. Another option is to clamp the block to your rip fence and butt each workpiece up against it. In this case, you wouldn't want to use a piece of standard 3 quarter inch thick material for your stop block. Why not? Because that would require your table saw fence to be too close to the end of your workpiece. As you complete the cut, the offcut will rotate slightly. You need room between the offcut and the table saw fence so the workpiece doesn't become trapped in there and shoot back at you. That's the whole reason for using a stop block as a reference instead of the table saw fence itself. And it's why three quarters of an inch isn't enough. In fact, I made one that's exactly four inches wide. I can clamp it to my fence and use the fence's scale to set my measurement, since it's easy to add four inches to the length of any offcut. By positioning it close to me, I make sure the end of the workpiece clears the stop block and stays far enough away from the fence to avoid any problems at the end of the cut. I can't stress enough that you should never use your miter gauge to make a cut that goes all the way through a workpiece while the end of the board is against your saw's fence. If you do use a stop block, whether it's on the miter gauge or the table saw fence, watch out for dust buildup that can prevent your next workpiece from fully seating against it. Either blow it away between cuts or cut a chamfer on the block so the dust has somewhere to go. And one final tip. You can add a screw to a stop block to create a micro adjuster to fine tune any cut. Let's do some troubleshooting. What if you follow all the rules 
and your table saw cross cuts just aren't coming out right. The most obvious solution is your miter gauge isn't square to the blade. But if you've already checked that, be sure there is no dust built up on the auxiliary fence itself that may prevent the workpiece from laying flat against it. Be sure your miter gauge's bar fits well in the miter slot. If your bar can't be adjusted, you can use a punch to create two or three dimples on the side of the bar. This will raise some steel around the dimples to take up the gap in the slot. Don't go too deep at first or you'll have to file them back down. Make small adjustments to find the perfect fit through trial and error. A lot of folks pay attention to the angle of their miter gauge, but neglect to check the angle of their saw blade. You can check to see if it's perpendicular to the top of the saw by making a quick cut, then flipping the off cut over and reassembling the pieces. If you see a gap, adjust your saw. Likewise, the blade should be parallel to the miter slot. If it isn't, you won't get a crooked cut. Instead, you'll get a workpiece that's shorter than you expected because you lined up your cut with the front of the blade, but by the time the back of the blade is engaged, it's cutting in a different position. Crooked cuts can also come from blade deflection. This is especially true if you're trimming a tiny bit near the end of a workpiece. It may deflect away from the blade during the cut and the result will be a slight angle on the end. A stop block or sandpaper on your auxiliary fence will help prevent this. Finally, avoid pulling the workpiece straight back toward you at the end of the cut, dragging the end back across the side of the blade. You may end up trimming a tiny bit more off than you wanted to. In our next part of this series, we'll take a look at angled cuts like miters and bevels. If that video is already posted, I encourage you to watch it and the two previous parts using the links below this video. Again, if you're on YouTube, just click on Show More. See you there. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.